Thank you very much. I hope you um, enjoyed the film. And I would very much like to introduce to you Becky McDonald from the Women at Risk International. Becky? And time takes on while rivers of tears run as a hidden gender side sweeps the globe. At War International, we unveil what's hidden and reclaim what's beautiful. Yet our war has victims disguised as statistics. Like the 800,000 people illegally trafficked across borders in the 365 days of our year. Half are children. While 70% of trafficked women end up as sexual slaves chained to beds of horror. In the United States, human trafficking is the fastest growing organized crime. The FBI estimates that 100,000 to 300,000 children are missing. 300 children are sold in Atlanta, Georgia each month. All around our beautiful creation, newborn babies are purchased for $25. Every 15 seconds, in one city alone, a girl is brutally circumcised, while honor killings and acid attacks are disguised as accidents. Fear strikes women around the world, haunted by domestic violence and rape. In total, every two to four years, 114 to 200 million women go demographically missing from all manners of risk. At Women at Risk International, we know God sees our suffering and weeps. We're fighting against 14 high-risk issues in many different countries. We give voice to those who have been silenced and a new life to live. One desperate mother sold her two-week-old daughter into slavery for $200. Action was taken immediately, and this baby was rescued from her captors. Today, she is safe, adopted, and protected by a loving family. This precious baby is a living, breathing example of hope. We have lifted hundreds of at-risk children and orphans who are now protected. Every missing woman has a story. Through War International, you have the power to help women be rescued from slavery, redeemed by love, restored to circles of protection, empowered to work with dignity, and unveiled. How will you respond? Perhaps as simple as hosting a war chest jewelry party, offering international gifts handcrafted by rescued and at-risk women. Shopping for these products will help women regain lives of dignity. Together, we will wrap arms of love and whisper worth back into the hearts and lives of millions. You have the power to help us exchange tears of sorrow for tears of joy. Join us in spreading the message of hope. Visit warinternational.org. Good evening. Tonight was a hard subject, wasn't it? Very sobering. Well, I'm here to tell you there's hope. I would not come here and be chicken little and say the sky is falling if I weren't here to tell you that what we do really works and thousands of women and children and men have been rescued and set free and are rebuilding their lives. And so tonight I want to open your eyes to an issue that is not just in Cambodia, as the film showed, and is not just kidnapping. Only 3% of trafficking victims in the United States of America are kidnapped. But it is a wildfire of epic proportions. It is the fastest growing arm of crime in the United States of America. Seven years ago, our international headquarters in Grand Rapids, Michigan, got a call from Homeland Security. They were coming to Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is the Midwest, it's a small, conservative um, town, and they were coming there three times a week. At the time they came and asked to meet with me, we had just rescued this baby you saw who was sold at two weeks old for $200 
We had just rescued her at one month old. And I was sharing this with Homeland Security, and they were looking at that time for a live advertised pay-per-view. You could sign up with money to watch a live feed in the land of the free of an anal rape of a six-month-old. They did not find that baby. And at that time, seven years ago, this was this devastated me. And I began moving around the United States looking at the issue of trafficking in the United States of America. And I discovered, first of all, in West Michigan, where I come from, where our headquarters is, 2,400 minors are for sale at any given time. New York has 3,500 minors. This is just a <coughs> child statistic. 3,500 children for sale at any given time. That's more children for sale in New York than all the women of all ages in a whole year that die of breast cancer. This is a cry from my heart to yours to circle your cradle. Wisconsin has a problem as well. Seven years ago, we began studying the issue of trafficking globally, and we identified as an organization 15 demographics or 15 things that draw the eye of a trafficker to a community. Wisconsin has 12 of the 15. West Michigan has 12 of the 15. And we can talk about, you saw tourism. Tourism is one of the flashpoints in West Michigan because we have the lake. It's a flashpoint in Wisconsin because you have tourism here. Those are some of the examples for you. Toledo, Ohio is the fourth highest city in America for, for trafficking because of the transportation industry. If you draw an, an X on the United States, it goes right through Toledo, north, south, east, west. So this issue is a huge issue that's stalking our nation. It's growing faster than guns and drugs. Imagine something worse than that. I mean, we see that on the news every night. And this is growing faster than that. Because you know, guns and drugs, when you sell 100 pounds of anything, there are real consequences to that. But you can sell a 100 pound child over and over and over, and it's just good business because there are very few consequences to that. So trafficking is not about sex or labor. Those are the two forms of trafficking. It's about money. It's slavery. It's a third person who is selling a human being against their will to do something they would not do on their own. Women at Risk International is in 45 countries addressing multiple risk issues. You saw them in that video there honor killings and acid attacks and female circumcision and rape and AIDS. We're most known for our fight against human trafficking because women shop and all of our product is made in our safe houses by rescued women or in our preventative programs by women who are at risk who are about to be sold or they're a widow or they're an orphan or they're abandoned or they're raped. Something about their story says they're exponentially at risk. Six years ago, you want me to use the microphone? Okay. Can you hear me in the back okay? Yeah. Six years ago, we began rescuing women in Grand Rapids, Michigan and West Michigan, and we started a um, beta test of what this would look like in America, and we've been involved in helping start eight safe houses in the United States of America in the land of the free. This week, or actually last week, I came, I just got back from the Pentagon the day before I came here and teaching in, at Fort Bray, Fort Belvoir, Department of Corrections, Department of Transportation, universities, hospitals, and situations like this, anywhere where people want to talk about this issue. And my passion is to open your eyes to a world of risk around you and help you be a safe place to those you love. We're not all called to be, to start a safe house and be Mother Teresa, but we're all called to be a safe place to those we love. So how this presents itself matters. So we began an eight hour training day where we teach how to know the signs, how to know the 22 lures and the 21 physical and emotional signs. We bring in law enforcement and health care providers and social workers and survivors and share the story of rescue. Women at Risk International fights trafficking in three ways, curative, preventative, and supportive. 
Curative is going to the woman in her place of captivity, identifying that she's there against her will, and helping her out. Now I'm 57, and I've been doing this for 33 years as a grown-up. I can tell you my story. I grew up overseas as a American expatriate in lands steeped in traditions of the Taliban. I went to boarding school in Pakistan, about five miles from where they caught Osama bin Laden. <laughs> it's like telling me that he's at the local Dairy Queen. So I learned at an early age that women and children are at risk. But I want you to know that the issue of trafficking is not a gender problem. I want you to hear me really well. Tonight, you saw mostly men selling girls. But a lot of traffickers are women. And the newest cutting edge of trafficking in the United States of America is 15 to 18 year old cool girls at school recruiting nine and 10 year old girls to go to an oral sex party that they don't know that's what it is and they can't drive themselves home. And they coerce them into something and then take pictures of it and blackmail them. It's a 14-year-old at Shauna Newell in Pensacola, Florida that goes to a party and is sold on the internet for $300,000. The face of trafficking in the United States of America is girls trafficking girls. We have them on tape saying, I need my stuff. I want that $400 Prada bag and I don't want to work for it. Or $100 jeans. Only 8% of all trafficking victims are addicted to drugs and are trafficked because of that. It is a myth to believe that all trafficking happens because of drug addiction. For sure, in America, a trafficker is going to get a girl addicted to drugs once he or she gets her. Because you know, once a person's addicted, <laughs> you can do any, they'll do anything you ask. And you don't have to break their ribs and threaten them and torture them. Overseas, as you saw, they don't give the girls drugs. They're not about to waste money on them. They will torture them in some way or shape. In fact, in the beginning, rather disgustingly, it depicted the whole issue of episiotomies, didn't it? Did you catch that? Yes, if a child is scared enough, they can sew her up and keep reselling her until she's broken. A UN doctor witnessed not a girl who had had nine episiotomies before she was so catatonic that you couldn't fake anymore that she wasn't a virgin. This is an evil world, and, and, and evil reinvents itself in ways that just blow your mind. And every time I think I've seen it all, heard it all, I'm always awakened to one more aspect of evil. But you know what? There's nothing new under the sun. And really what it all comes down to is money. Two to three women in America can bring in half a million dollars tax-free. <laughs> I don't know what kind of money you have to make to clear that kind of money legally, but that's good business. And trafficking, after all, is about money. Whether it's labor or whether it's sexual slavery, 70-80% of it is sexual slavery. There's a small portion of it that's labor. Often labor, slavery, and sexual slavery go together. If you study at the table out there that has the product, there is a handout on Wisconsin that gives some recent trafficking stories in your news. Some of them are about labor. Most of them are about sexual slavery. But it gives you some recent um, indicators and information. When um, we started tonight, I don't know, is this two hours long? In two hours, every 30 seconds, a human being is sold into slavery. So in two hours' time, what is that? 240 people that are sold into slavery. This crime is growing so fast that governments are finally noticing it and doing something about it. Now, we rescue women in three ways, and I could, um, talk all night about wonderful stories of women that have been rescued. We have safe houses that have 500 women, those that have 440 women, some that have 193 women, maybe 38 women. In America, we don't like institutionally sized things, so our safe houses here tend to be five to eight women. 
because we like things smaller, but the curative is going to the woman in her place of captivity, identifying that she's there against her will, and rescuing her out. In Cambodia, which you saw tonight in that movie, which by the way was actually filmed in Thailand, that market where he lost that little girl is a market I've been in many times, but in Cambodia, 90% of the women that get sent home, that get picked up in a police raid and sent home without job training get resold. You cannot rescue a woman, pat her on her head, tell her nasty little life you had there, go do something nice, when she's been chained to a wall, literally with a shackle around her neck, sold for 11 months to whoever comes to the front door and rescued at seven years old. True story. I could tell you about Chloe, who was sold in America by her father to American politicians and today is safe and happily married. I could tell you about a four-year-old and an eight-year-old, little, two little boys that were, that were rescued and came to the safe house of men and boys that we have in Thailand the day I was there. And they were chasing frogs and fishing in the fish pond. Now, I don't mean to demean the pain and the journey of recovery that they have to go through, but as a mother for that moment in time, that was good for me to see because that's what we want little boys and girls to do is play and go to school and grow up and, and dream about what they're going to be. And my favorite question to ask our rescued women is, what do you want to be when you grow up? Whether they're 12 or 22 or 52 and they've never dreamed, and they're scared of dreaming. But rescuing women from abuse like that is a journey, then, that you walk with them forever. And it's not about a two-month, two-year program. It's about a lifetime journey. It's about being a family and circling them. I could tell you a story about a woman who jumped out of a five-story building to get away from her trafficker, like the man you saw in that movie. I could tell you about Dorinda, who was trafficked um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I met her in the red light district, and uh, a woman with me had been scammed and, and coerced and tricked into stripping, told it would be exotic dancing and that it would be safe, and it wasn't and it spiraled quickly into something very ugly and she was rescued out of that and she was with me and when the woman asked her you know what got you out we began a conversation with Dorinda and I said Dorinda do you um, like your job she said no I said well what brought you here well her mother had cancer and she had three mouths to feed and I said Dorinda I don't know what this looks like but you call the number on the back of this card. You come see me tomorrow. You come see me when you're ready. And I will help you write a resume. She was in my office the next day. And it took me three hours to write a resume. And I, I couldn't do it. There was nothing honest I could say about a woman who had only known the abuse of a strip club. So I finally looked at her and said, Dorinda, do you want to make jewelry? <laughs> she goes, what? I said, you know, this is a headquarters and we have no room left but there's a staff kitchen. I'll make everybody eat at their desk and you can have the staff kitchen and make jewelry. So she began making jewelry for us. Some of that jewelry out there is made in America. And when I get called to Senate subcommittees for, to be an expert witness, I am no expert, but I know who is, and that's the survivor. And I took Dorinda with me and I, she testified to the fact that in our adult entertainment in America, children are for sale. A study out of Boston of um, men that buy, 96% of them said they knew how to find children. So this is an issue in our own country. We don't talk about it, and um, it's ugly, and the curative is going to these people and helping them out. When I took Dorinda with me to a Senate subcommittee, we were in the car afterwards leaving, and she's like, Becky, I used to be criminalized. I used to be a criminal. What was done to me was criminal, and I was a criminal. And she said, now I make beautiful jewelry, and I'm an expert witness. And she's just bouncing off the ceiling, because she sees women loving her jewelry, and she's making a living with dignity. Our passion 
is to give women a safe place to rewrite the story of their life and let them dream and find a way to support themselves with dignity. So all our safe houses have to have a business plan of how the product that they produce pays the overhead, the electric bill, and the salaries. We raise money to do capital improvement. So if they need a car, if they need a building, if they need a fridge, if they need one-time expenses, that's what we raise donations for. But the sale of their jewelry pays for their reoccurring costs. If you look at the paper out there that is about Wisconsin, it talks about a sting that was done by the FBI and the number of children picked up from Wisconsin was the second highest state after San Francisco. Wisconsin in that particular state had the most children were from Wisconsin. The second way that we help rescue women is preventative. And you cannot just rescue and address the issue of the one that's trafficked. You have to go back to the families, the villages, and the cultures that they come from. So when we find out that there's a village where 90% of the children are being forced into the red light district, we take our sewing academy back there and hire those women so that they don't end up at our safe house. So we've graduated lawyers and doctors and school teachers and goat herders and cosmetologists and in Cambodia, one of our partners there is a cake decorating tea, tea or bakery. They do, we took a five-star hotel cake decorator there who runs the program now. They make such incredible cakes that they supply the royal family with their cakes. So whatever their dream is, that is what we are looking to help them do. In the preventative programs, it might be something um, like the Friendship bracelets. Do any of you younger people in here have a friendship bracelet on? Anybody? Raise your hand. No? You know those friendship bracelets that our kids wear until they brought off their body? Those things? I prefer pearls, but um, <laughs> I, anything I mock sells. So there's a whole village. Plane loads go to the Philippines for sexual tourism of children. They're known for that. There's a whole village of 700 moms that make those friendship bracelets out there that are, what, two bucks? And it pays for all their school tuition, their books, their uniforms, a community center that babysits these kids after the, the school day is over until their parents come home from school. So preventative programs are those things like, um, one of our partners is the Queen of Thailand. Her relative um, makes hand-painted cards that you can look at out there, and she hires women from the slums and teaches them to paint. They're all hand-painted. Her proceeds go for anti for uh, breast cancer treatment, and our proceeds go for anti-trafficking. And then there's supportive, and that's you. The good news is there's a solution to this problem, and it's you. The bad news is Wisconsin is a target, as are your children. This is not a foreign-only problem like that film, the only thing I have against that film is I don't want you to leave here thinking that this is a foreign problem. This is a universal problem. And children and women and kids and boys are at risk in our country, in every community. And I'm here today to ask you to be an everyday hero. It was not a cop that rescued Teresa Flores who was from an upper middle class family. Her grandfather was a judge who was asked to be on the Nuremberg trials. Senators sat at their kitchen table. It was a waitress that rescued her. What got her into trafficking was a ride home from school and date rape drug in her Coca-Cola with a per permission and a ride home from school. It was not a cop that rescued Shauna Newell who was sold on the internet. It happened to be her brother who happened to see her in the back of a car in a, at a gas station. It was not a cop who rescued the girl that jumped out of a five-story building. It was her landlord who said, you know, there's a place down the street that helps women like you. What I want you to see tonight is that we can all be that circle of protection to those we love. We can all be a safe place to someone that needs our help. 
And President Kennedy said we face a moral crisis when he was talking about um, slavery of a different sort. He said it cannot be quieted by token moves. It's time to act above all in our daily lives. We preach freedom around the world and cherish it at home. But in the land of the free, if the rights of even one man, woman, or child are threatened, then we are all threatened. Those who do nothing are inviting shame. Those who act boldly are recognizing right. And my cry to you tonight is to recognize right and to do the right thing. There is a clear and present danger in this country, and it's attacking our youth. And now is the time as a nation to shine the light on this. Right now on the other side of the world and right now as night is coming, staff all over the world in our safe houses in 45 countries, including the United States of America, are faithfully invading the darkness and telling people, come to the light. There's another option. Come, we'll help you find a way out. And we need a nation of a million lights. We need to um, hear the cry of the wounded. There is a port in your packet of brochures there. There is a card. Not every story has a happy ending. This card here is a child that's tied to a pole being sold in the red light district of India where we rent two rooms in a brothel that are meant for sex. And one is a clinic and one is like a tea room or a counseling room or a, I don't know what you want to call it. But women can come in there if they have a client or a customer they're afraid of and get away from them because these are our rooms. Her mother came to us, her mother was all of 16, and said, I had a baby and I'm not allowed to hold it. It was put in a cardboard box and every time she cries, they beat her black and blue. And they said she has to grow up to not know love. Well, babies have a way of crawling out of boxes, don't they? So they tied her to this pole and they sent me this picture and they said, Becky, please send this around and get people to pray or be concerned or do something. And I said, no, this is sensational. This is, um, <laughs> we don't show pictures of people that we don't have their permission. And they, they begged me. And I said, all right, you think about it for a week, I'll think about it for a week. And that week I got pictures of my six grandkids. And you know how fast they change, don't you? Well, this is her at 10 months old. She's now two. You'd never know her from this picture. But this is an example of what is done to children all over the world. And I could tell you stories of children who have been treated like this, not tied to a pole, tied to a bed in the United States of America. One third of all trafficking victims are runaways. It's another myth to think they're all runaways. But one third are runaways, and they're usually running away from abuse. And I know a girl who ran away. And she ran to stripping, thinking that's better than being sold from my bedroom. And the first time she was raped and curled up in a fetal position at a strip club, the girls gave her day after pill, abortion pill, and heroin and said, you know what, this is the real world, get used to it. This is the real world of stripping in the United States of America. You wanna make a living, this is how you're gonna do it. There's nothing exotic or sexy or glamorous about it. Well, when we offered her a way out, she took it. But your daughter may end up in a situation where she's simply minding her own business, <laughs> needs a ride home from school, or she's sitting in class in a, English class and she gets a text message from somebody who says, hey honey, meet me at McDonald's. I'll buy you a Slurpee. I know a girl who was trafficked for a Slurpee. I know a girl who was kidnapped from a Wendy's. I know a girl who was trafficked for a hot dog in a movie. For sure, a runaway, the cops won't look, at, look for them for 48 hours, and for sure, they're gonna get picked up in the first 36 hours by a trafficker. Also in your packet, I see here is this form on Wisconsin that has the state um, details on it. This is about our US Training Center. This is about home parties. This one here is the one I want to draw your attention to. This is about domestic trafficking called Seeing the Unseen. And in there are some 800 numbers that you might want to put in your cell phone. 
One is a government 24-7 um, hotline. The other one is the war 1-800 number, 877 ends slavery. And if you think you see something, call it in. And there's information in here on how to do that. <coughs> this brochure has true stories. You can run your phone over the URL. Is that what it's called? <laughs> that little black box in there? And it will pull up the full story. Those are examples for you. But today, um, what I want to do is encourage you to fight trafficking and be an abolitionist to those you love. Because then there's, what, 50 safe houses in this room. And this is a call from my heart to yours to circle your cradle and to rise up and do something here. Dr. Martin Luther King said that it is not darkness that drives out darkness. It is light that drives out darkness. And we need to shine a light on this because the reason it flourishes is because nobody talks about it and people hide from it. I want to stop a minute and just take some questions from you so I don't totally confuse you. <laughs> yes? I understand the scope of your organization in trying to rescue uh, people caught up in this, boys, girls, and women. Is there any agencies going after the demand, the people who have the big bucks or whatever? kind of finance this whole uh, disgusting operation. Is there any, any, any organized the, effort the on the law enforcement side? FBI and law enforcement do go after the buyers. Um, it's always a man that asks me that question, and I tell him that's your job. <laughs> I'm not going after the bad guys. I'm looking for the victims. And um, a lot of times the, the bad guy, the buyers are men, but a lot of times the traffickers are women. And a lot of the worst torture I've ever dealt with is woman on woman. But yes, law enforcement and Wisconsin does have consequences for buyers. Now the one thing about the law in Wisconsin that's a loophole is that buyers can get out of buying a minor by saying, I didn't know. And a lot of states, they close that loophole so you can't have a defense that you didn't know. But Wisconsin still has, I mean, it's, they, there is a way that a really clever buyer can try and manipulate that issue in this state. So your laws are better than some states. They're better than Michigan. Um, they're not as good as Illinois. And there is a federal law and then there are state laws. And that is one of the problems I deal with. I learned 44 countries of laws and then I came to the United States of America and now I have to learn 50 laws. Because if there's not nexus, if there's not crossing of state to state, and nexus can be something as simple as the computer. So if somebody, if the buyer is in another state buying in this state, that creates nexus. If there's nexus, then federal law applies. If there's not nexus, then state law applies. In some states, you can be a 13-year-old and you're a consenting adult, and anything can be done to you. So one of the things when I speak to a thousand lawyers and bar associations, I beg them to get one set of laws because I now read penal codes on every state that I go to. In some states, a youth pastor is a mandated reporter. Other states, he's not. If a youth pastor sees something and doesn't report it, he can get in trouble. You never know until you read all the fine print of all these penal codes. So. Yes, there are consequences to buyers, and different states do different things. Some states advertise on billboards. <laughs> they put the faces of the buyers up there. And um, they just raised, I think in Wisconsin, they just raised the fee or the fine or the whatever it is from $2,500 to $5,000 or something. Um, every state is different. So law enforcement, <laughs> historically has um, gone after the woman and just thrown her in jail for prostitution and not said, hey honey, are you doing this? You know, is somebody forcing you? Is somebody threatening you? You're a minor. And so historically, law enforcement has just thrown the book at the girl, the prostitute. And the new um, 
effort federally is to make cops ask probing questions. When a cop says to me, well, you know, I, that, I just thought that was a prostitution deal gone bad. I'm like, what does that mean? And they're like, well, she didn't get paid. <laughs> I'm like, oh, really? What does that tell you? You know, that should make you ask some questions. And you know, cops are good people. They went into that business because they want to help people. And when you get them to start thinking, um, cynically, which they're trained to do and ask probing questions, they're very good at it. So it's just a matter of training and turning the perspective around and seeing that this person might be a victim. They might be a criminal, but they might be a victim. And they're scared spitless of you. And so you have to ask the question in a way that doesn't make them feel like they're gonna, you know, get prosecuted. Any other questions? Yes. You said there are 15 factors, and tourism was one of them. What were the other factors? Um, you have a transportation. I mean, I told you Toledo, Ohio is the fourth highest city for in America because of transportation. And Wisconsin has a transportation. You, the, the, tr there is a trafficking corridor from Mexico that ends, that goes through 12 states, and it ends up here in Minnesota, Wisconsin area. And you also have minorities here. You have Hmong people. You have American Indians. Um, whenever there are minorities of any sort, they can, they're vulnerable and they're exploitable. Um, you have migrant farming. West Michigan does too. I hesitate to bring that up because people think, oh, those foreigners, and that's not the point. Your daughter's at risk, your granddaughter's at risk. If she goes to high school, even if she's a homeschooler, she's at risk. I've interviewed homeschoolers who, because of their cell phones, <laughs> they're texting, they're attached at the hip, these kids, to that crazy cell phone, and I'm all for cell phones because it helps me know where my kids are, right? But they know things, and we, everyone in this room, everyone, how old are you, sweetie? 19? Okay, maybe not her. But everybody else, my daughter, my youngest is 24, and she didn't have texting when she was in high school. And she's like, wow, mom, even I'm out of it. I talked to 30-year-old moms, and they are clueless. They're deer in the headlights. This generation knows, they know all, thanks to Tiger Woods, we all now know what sexting is. Pre-Tiger Woods, we didn't know. Our generation did not know. But the 20s and under, they know everything, you guys. I'm not saying your kids are involved in everything, but I promise you they're seeing it in the, under the bleacher, in the back of the classroom, in the back of the bus, on, on their buddy's cell phone. They see it, it's all there. You don't have to park your car in a nasty parking lot anymore. You can dial up a rape from Cambodia. There's a rape camp there. Whoa. <laughs> the light came on. So, um, what was the question? I don't remember. <laughs> the factors. Oh, factors, thank you. So, s internet is a major factor. And the internet, cyber crime, the dark net, is the reason why this is a wildfire today and it wasn't 100 years ago. That's, I mean, there's been slavery and, and exploitation of people forever. But why is it the fastest growing arm of crime? It's because of the internet. Because there's anonymity, and before, with like drugs, you have to hand it off and you might get caught, and then you have to do it again. Whereas with the internet, you know, these people can hide behind the anonymity of that. And then they sell these girls from a hotel room or from a house, or from a bedroom, or wherever, from a strip club. And so it's harder to track down. Now the good news about the internet is that when you do, um, when, when there's porn or sexual exploitation on the internet, it leaves a digital fingerprint. That's the good news. People that use the internet to buy and sell are stupid. Because if you follow the trail, it's hard evidence. And many times when we rescue trafficking victims, we don't even use the trafficking laws. We use the kiddie porn laws because they're really good laws. 
and we just take whatever works the best. It'd be nice to throw everything at them because they're doing it all and they should have 14 convictions instead of four. But we go with what will work. So the internet is one reason. Um, you have minorities here. You have, um, well, we have youth culture in the West. Now this would not be true in a Muslim culture or conservative third world uh, Asian culture, but our youth generation does not view oral sex as sex. And so into that situation comes the slimy reach of the trafficker. And he says, hey honey, you're doing this like a back rub to be cool with the football player. How about you do it for $400 and then you can buy a Prada bag. So it may not be poverty, but it's materialism. And so they, into that moral petri dish environment comes a text message or people take pictures of it in blackmail. And so youth culture in America is in a, in a place that they view that very differently. And so for sure traffickers exploit that and will pay money for that. And I don't have the statistics in front of me, but I think the Center for Disease Control said that 62% of children who engage in oral sex will have intercourse within six months. And so it's just, you know, it's one of those things, it's a portal to um, a trafficker and it's something that they can exploit. Those are some examples for you. There are other ones. Um, Transport. Oh, military. I was just in Fairfax County. Virginia has 27 military bases. Some states have one. For sure, they are a target. The mil the traffickers set up camp outside of military bases because they're targeting men who are away from home and with adult entertainment sites. There are 143 adult entertainment sites in in Virginia. Some states have four. And for sure in this country, in my experience, adult entertainment is a legal portal to illegal activity. I'm not saying it's all illegal. I'm just saying that it's a very safe place to hide all kinds of illegal activity. And the FBI, we have them on tape and many others saying, for sure, wherever there's adult entertainment, there is trafficking and there are children for sale. And that is my 30 years of experience, unfortunately. Any other questions? Yes. Has your organization ever been threatened by uh, traffickers? No, um, but one of my partners was, when this movie happened, it actually was um, done in Thailand, even though it's about Cambodia. And one of my partners was in the red light district with Myro Servino, the Hollywood star in this. And her bodyguards told my partner, people are making threats against you. And my partner took National Geographic into the mafia, the Russian mafia owned hotel that we do outreach in, where women are sold in a glass room, they're thrown in there naked, and they're picked out in the glass room like in a glass bowl. And that was, I was like, Annie, why'd you do that? Because that advertised to the world. I mean, we stopped doing outreach there for a while. We obey the rules. We don't break rules. We don't ever, um, interact with the buyer, we, we build a relationship with the bar and brothel owners and traffickers because we need their permission to work with their women. And so we don't ever get up in their Kool-Aid. The only time I've ever got, gotten involved like that is when a man is pulling a woman by her hair. And then I go to the bouncers and I call on the protective instinct in them, and I'm like, why do you let these men do this to your beautiful women? They're like, oh yeah. 
and then they go and they help me. Or I'll, with the Taliban, sometimes I've called on that protective instinct in them to get them to help me when a woman is being attacked publicly like that. But we build a relationship and we're telling our, our preferred method of rescue is outreach. Yes, we get women from police raids, and you know what? The attrition from that is awful because they don't know you, they don't trust you, and they shouldn't. They can't trust anybody. They're going to run away if they have half a brain in their head and take their chances. But when you build a relationship with the woman and outreach and you're going into the red light districts two, three nights a week and you're saying, hi, how are you? What's your name? Really, what is your name? Diane. Diane. And we're talking to Diane. We're saying, how are you doing today? And what's going on in your life? And it looks like you have a black and blue spot. Are you okay? Do I need it? Can I take you to the hospital? Can I pay for your stitches? We're just getting to know them and finding out their story and saying, how did you come to work here? Do you like your job? And we're just giving out business cards saying, if you ever want to make a living in a different way, call the number on the back of this card. And so we're very non-combative. We are not vigilantes. Um, fighting the bad guys, we actually are building relationships with the bar and brothel owners and they will sometimes bring us a woman and say she's really messed up and she's really fighting here you take her. <laughs> or they'll say my daughter is home from school I don't want her in the bar and we're like fine send her to our, to our safe house we'll teach her to make jewelry. Hypocrite. <laughs> but um, we gladly will take their girls or their daughters. If we happen to be in the red light district and we see their daughters in their in their little school uniforms, ooh, scary thing. We're like, hey, your daughter's home on school leave? How about you send her, we'll pay her and teach her to make jewelry. Like, oh, okay. So we're very interactive with them to build a relationship of trust with them. And honestly, you know one of the weirdest things about strip clubs in America <laughs> and around the world, but America, is the strip club owners think they're doing those girls a favor. They really think they're good guys. They think they're keeping them from being out on the street. And they're very proud of the fact that they're nice. It's really, you know, the rational brain rationalizes things, doesn't it? Irrationally. So we build relationships with them so that we can um, intervene and speak into them. And so they trust us. So no, I've never yet, I'm not saying it will never happen, but um, I've never ever felt afraid. And it's because we obey the rules. Any other questions? Yeah. Did the ABC uh, catch a predator ever have an influence on what you do or trafficking or just bring attention to it? Yes, and catch a predator, those kinds of stings where they, um, you know, certain states, this one is one of them, allow cops to do things like that, where they can pretend to be um, buying and set up a sting like that. And what that does is it threatens the buyer and lets them know if you get caught, you're gonna be on a sexual registry, you may be on a billboard, your family is gonna be notified. In some states, they are forced to take John class, they're called Johns, and they have to take a class, and in that class they're, they're, they hear from women who have been in the industry who aren't bought, being bought, so they're not. If you went into a restaurant and you were a snot to the waitress and she threw coffee on your lap, would you tip her? No. And so these girls, of course, are going to pretend they like their job. Because if they don't get paid, they get beaten. And in Thailand, or in Cambodia, they will give them electrical shocks up the vagina <coughs> three times a day to make them submit. They're not gonna give them drugs, they're gonna torture them. Or they'll beat them in Chicago and break their ribs while they're pregnant and make them go sell themselves with broken ribs pregnant. So if you pick that woman up, she would say, this is the father of my baby because he raped her, but he's really her trafficker. But she's scared to death of him. So yes, all of those efforts help. And you know, there's only one reason that I don't speed. One, it's called consequences. 
I mean, when the street is dry and nobody's around, <laughs> I want to go fast, but I don't because of consequences, right? So I think when there's consequences to things that are wrong, that seem harmless, I mean, what's the, what's the problem of going 70 on a street in the middle of the night? Have you ever stopped at a red light in the middle of the night and sat there and nobody's around? And you just sit there and you're like, Ew! you know? So granted, we're talking about moral issues and attacking a child or a human being is a, another whole issue. But honestly, for people with no conscience about that, they need consequences. And so that is definitely something that law enforcement works on. Any other? Yes? Do places that have legal prostitution, are they subject to the same trafficking? Because there's always going to be something that helps. Yeah, legal prostitution. I have worked in Amsterdam. I work in Amsterdam. And legal prostitution is extremely exploitive. Because what happens is, um, it's an, again, it's like a legal portal to illegal activity. So I was at a conference in London, Queen Noor was speaking, Aung San Suu Kyi, Nobel laureates, United Nations, ambassadors, all these fancy pants people. I almost didn't go, but I went because they had survivors from Pakistan, Bangladesh, and countries that I have interest in. And one of the survivors on the human trafficking panel was a little girl, little meaning tiny, not, I mean, she's in her 20s, but she was trafficked from Bulgaria to Amsterdam, sold in a window. One of her customers helped her win her freedom from her trafficker and took him to court. But then the Dutch government would only give her a green card to sell herself. Literally, that was the only thing she could legally do. So she's sitting on this panel and she says, all I want is a normal job. I hadn't said anything for three days. And you know, this like 300 people, mostly lawyers, from, you know, leaders of the United Nations and all this stuff. And, and everybody gets up after the panel and asks questions. And I thought, okay, this just, I'm blowing steam out my ears. <laughs> so I stand up and I think, okay, if I'm supposed to say something, they're gonna have to pick me because everybody stands up. And they picked me first. And I looked at those two girls up there and I said, you know, I came here because of you two. I came here because you're my heroes. You had the guts and the courage to come into this august room. I mean, there was a supermodel there. And you are standing here and telling your story. And you have the courage to stand in front of these people and talk about your pain. You are my heroes and you're why I'm here. And then I turned on the audience and I said, and how about us? We all came here because we want to set people free. And you heard her. You all lead countries. You lead Reuters. You lead all these companies, these Fortune 500 world-class companies. I said, I'd like to see 20 of you lined up offering her a job. You heard her, not my words, her. She wants just a normal job. And I said, and if you're too embarrassed to do that, then shame on you. What do you come here for? Put your money where your mouth is. You want to set someone free? Here's a little girl that needs to be set free right now. Everybody claps. So I sit down. Afterwards, the lady in charge comes up to me who runs Reuters. Oh, Becky, we're so, you know, that was great. And I'm like, Me. I said, you run Reuters. Would you give her a job? Give her a job cleaning. Give her a job making photocopies. I don't care. She starts backing up. Oh, well, you know, I don't do, I'm not HR. Blah, 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 blah. I said, please. And I walked away from her and I went to Lena. And I sat by Lena. Now, on the platform, she minded her P's and Q's. In person, if my kids talked like that, I'd wash their mouth out with soap. But I honestly wanted to burst out laughing because she was real. All these fancy pants people talk, 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 United Nations ambassadors and whatever. And I was just sick of it. I was ready to scream, spit, and go blind. And Lena looks at me and she goes, I said, I'm going to come visit you. And she's like, yeah, right. I've been there twice a year ever since. And this last a year ago, January, she finally got a green card. Now her undergraduate is interior decorating. She got a green card and she is a floral designer in one of the largest tulip floral whatever's 
in Amsterdam. And she said to me, this little girl who had to sell herself or she'd get kicked out of the country and put in jail, she said, you know, Becky, for the first time in my life, I feel like a girl. She said, I skip to work. She said, I hear the birds and I see the clouds and the sky. And she says, I've never, ever felt like a girl before. That from a prostitute. So legal prostitution is a bunch of bunk in my experience. It's just a legal portal for a lot of exploitation. And the Dutch government did a study and discovered that only 4% of their prostitutes in those windows were actually Dutch women, which meant that 96% were coming from poor countries and were being exploited. And their solution was to pay the traffickers for downtown real estate in Amsterdam and close it down. It's just empty now. I was, I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, where we have a lot of Dutch people, and they're really good with their money. And I'm just like, this is shocking. This is not good storage. What are you buying? What are you paying these people? Millions of these bad guys, millions of dollars, just so you can close their, their windows, which only makes the windows that are still open, their price just doubled. And those girls have to pay that whether they have a customer or not. So my experience around the world with legalized prostitution is that it's a very bad model. I'm not a fan of it. And in, not, in 57 years of life, I have yet to meet a woman who says, Becky, this is what I want to do with my life. Get over it. I, you know, I'll get back to you when I do. But that nobody grows up and wants to do that for a living. Now, I will say that once they once they're broken and once they're they give up, then their only dream is to find Richard Gere and that meal ticket out. And so they do become predatory then because they're desperate to get out of that. So one woman in Thailand got out, she found her meal ticket to America, a GI. And every two years, he takes her back to Thailand. And he says, go get me a threesome. And she's like, I'm your wife. And he's like, this is where you came from. This is who you are. Don't you ever forget it. So there's the dream come true. So it's not a dream. There's nothing, nothing, nothing glamorous about it. And it's a lie and it's, it's a scam. And our culture promotes that, you know, Hollywood, that a woman in American culture, we promote that a woman is the sum total of her externals. You know, it's all about hooters. And it's all about Botox. And it's all about Kardashians or whatever their names are, I don't even know. It's all about the externals. And so we as a culture sell the lie to our daughters that what you look like is more important than who you are and what your character is. And so we don't have exploitation like Cambodia rampant. Oh, we have it. Believe me, I have women that I've rescued who are sold by their mothers in America or by their boyfriend, if you want to call them that. But it's not out in the open like that. But we, we sell another whole set of lies that the media sells us, that it's what you look like that makes you important and makes you attractive and makes you meaningful and have purpose. Any other questions? I want to close in, with telling you about the pearl. I love it that all our pearls are real because I tell our women, you're like the pearl. You know, that little clam is sitting in the bottom of the ocean minding its own business, and along comes an unfair attack. It's a parasite that bores a hole in the side of the clam, and it has two choices. It can fight it and be a mutant, or it can wrap it in layers and layers and layers of knacker and beauty and create a pearl of great price. And the greater the heat in the ocean, the faster it grows, the bigger it grows and the more valuable it is. And so we too in life, when life attacks us, fairly or unfairly, have two choices. We can fight it and be a mutant. <laughs> and we all know people like that, don't we? 
They're just open pussy sores that never close shut and ooze all over everybody. Or we can wrap it in layers of beauty and dignity and say, you know, this happened in my life. How can I use this to help somebody else? And today at lunch, I sat with a survivor who's done that. She started an organization in this city that goes into the red light districts and tells women, you're valuable. You have worth, you have dignity. And she has taken that pain in her own life of being trafficked in Green Bay. And she's turned around as a pearl of great price. And she said, you know, the purpose of this in my life is so that I can do for somebody else what nobody did for me. And that's the purpose of pain. Pain is a actual, suffering actually is an opportunity. We don't see that in the West. <laughs> it's an opportunity to say, how can I learn from this and how can I use this to be to somebody else what nobody was to me? And every time you do that, I promise you, you'll feel good and you'll buy back some of your pain. So I know in a room this size, there's people here who are walking beside a family member or a friend or maybe yourself that is attacked fairly or unfairly. Doesn't really matter to me. Abuse is wrong. You have worth and dignity. You deserve the best. And if you're walking beside somebody in that situation, wrap arms of love around them and whisper worth into them and tell them this is not your fault. You know what? If this little 19-year-old runs down that street out there stark naked, that gives nobody the right to lay a finger on her. She's an idiot, but nobody has the right to lay a finger on her. Nobody deserves attack. We were created for worth and dignity. And we, need to, we just need to ooze that and whisper that into our circles of influence. So thank you, and let your whispers be a roar. Join your voices together. In the animal kingdom, um, the male lion has one job, really. All he has to do is roar when the sun sets. The female lionesses is the only cat in the cat family where they hunt together. And they do 80-90% of the hunting. They're the grocery shoppers. And they raise cubs. And 80% of their cubs don't make it till age two. And the male lion only has one job, and that's to roar at dusk and send the message, this is my pride, it goes a five mile radius, stay away or I'll bite your head off. And you know what, if he doesn't do it, guess what? Two or three females do it for him. Now men, it's not fair, but it's a reality in my experience that men's voices in the cultures of the world have more weight than women's voices. When two women stick up for a woman, when I stick up for a woman, or girls stick up for a girl, we sound whiny. Or that's what the cult world says we sound. When a man sticks up for a woman, especially when there's no women around, that's really powerful. Your voices have more weight. And the good news is men are stepping into this industry. I've been an abolitionist for 30 years. And I've been a lone voice in my generation, a weirdo. <laughs> this 20-year-old generation, I, they get it. They're born with a social justice gene. But when I meet in groups of people, more and more men are lining up and signing up and saying, how can we be a circle of protection to those we love? And we need men and women to let our whispers be a roar and join our voices to deter infanticide. And one last thing about lions. If you watch a video, you can Google it online. All these lionesses are sitting around, okay? And into the middle of them comes a cobra. Little tiny slithery snake. These are the, the king of beasts, right? But that snake has the power to take any one of them out. And what do they do? All those female lionesses get up, they don't run around going, where's my cub, where's my cub, where's my cub? No, they each reach down and pick up whatever cub is right there knowing every other one of their sisters will do the same and they start backing up, and they take those cubs to safety, and one lioness stays behind and waits till that cobra disappears. So I ask you, 
whether you have children of your own, it doesn't matter. We need to join forces and we need to lift whatever cup, whatever human being is in our line of vision that's in trouble and pick them up and remove them from the snare. And this is just a call, a really wild call to just be that circle of protection and let your whispers be a roar. You can do it. Join arms with others. Get other people in your circle and lift your circle to safety. We are not going to wipe out trafficking. We aren't. Any more than we wipe out domestic violence or whatever. But you can, you can, I truly believe, you can create safe circles around your circle of influence. And we can give you a banquet of ways. You can go shopping out there. Men, Mother's Day is coming up. Go buy your wife a pearl. You know what, if you offered me 20 bucks tonight, and said, Becky, go rescue somebody. I say, keep your money and go buy a $20, $18 pearl pendant, real pearl. Because a week, a month from now, the pain of giving that up will be over and you will forget the woman that fashioned it. But if you wrap something of hers around you and make her life part of your life, you will remember her every time you wear it and you will tell the story. And you know what? I don't want your money. I want your heart because I need an army to rise up and circle your cradle. Thank you for coming and listening to a very hard subject. And that's the second time I've watched that movie. <laughs> and I think it gets harder each time I watch it. It was definitely harder this time. The first time I was being very analytical, this time it was like, oh, that hurts, doesn't it? But you know what? Forewarned is forearmed. So rise up and protect your own. So thank you for coming. And I'll be around.